Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here to uh, talking about are we changing course or is this just a course correction and how governments are evolving their approach to cybersecurity. I'm really pleased to be joined by uh, three good friends uh, in the policy community here in Washington, and I'll let each one of them introduce themselves in turn. I'm Michael Daniel. I'm the president and CEO of the Cyber Threat Alliance, which is a nonprofit cyber threat intelligence sharing organization. Uh, we have about 30 something members from around the world. Um, I, prior to CTA, I served for many years in the US government, uh, the last four and a half as the US cybersecurity coordinator. Um, Sanjeet, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Michael. Sanjeet Mantawa, uh, Director of Government Affairs here in Washington, DC with Broadcom. Uh, Prior to Broadcom, I was with Symantec prior to the acquisition about four and a half years ago or so. And prior to my time at Symantec, I had spent 15 years at the FBI, uh, mostly in national security law uh, uh, sector. Thanks, Mike. Great. Jim. Okay, I'm Jim Richberg. I'm the head of cyber policy and the global field CISO at Fortinet. I have been with Fortinet for five years. Prior to that, I had a full career in the federal government. I was the national intelligence manager for cyber. Michael and I spent a lot of quality time in various government rooms. And uh, one of the things we did was put together and then I monitored and coordinated the implementation of the comprehensive national cybersecurity initiative for Presidents Bush and Obama. And Tatiana. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Tatiana Bolton. I uh, I do cybersecurity policy at Google. Uh, so uh, that includes secure by default, uh, connected device security, and uh, and cyber workforce, among other things. Uh, previously, I was at the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, and before that, uh, at CISA and DoD. Great. Well, thanks everyone for. Uh, we appear to have lost uh, Sanjeet for a moment, but. Um, We'll keep going here. Um, I think, you know, the premise of this panel is that, you know, recent U.S., uh, frank, not just U.S., but European, Australian, Japan, other government strategies are pointing towards a change, uh, a rather marked change in how they approach uh, cybersecurity and moving away from a model that we used for probably well on 20 years to something a little more activist. And I guess my first question out of the box is, is that premise correct? Um, is that what you're seeing in sort of the policy space, you know, particularly here in the United States? And Jim, maybe we can start with you on that. So I think this is a fairly a, a fairly dramatic change, Michael. You know, what we were doing with the CNCI and, and some of these other cyber strategies is we're going to use the powers of government. We're largely, everything's working okay. We need to optimize a bit. And this was a fairly stark assertion that we've had a market failure on cybersecurity, that doing it has been optional. Those who did it paid a literal cost. Those who didn't were free riders until the bad thing happens, that it's time to level set across the the producers, that it's time to provide transparency to consumers. To, you know, this is this is a different dialogue. This is about how to really leverage market forces rather than government forces. So I think this is a big difference. Yeah. Tatiana, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, over the past five years or so, there have been a number of big uh, events that have led to what we're seeing now, which I agree is a market, market shift. Um, We've, we had uh, the Colonial Pipeline, we had uh, the Solarium Commission report and uh, subsequent, uh, subsequent recommendations. Uh, we had the pandemic and, uh, and I think recently the, uh, the several significant Microsoft hacks. And so through all of that, uh, I think the federal government uh, here in the US and then also European governments particularly, are are really moving towards a much more aggressive posture with uh, with policy, uh, the DMA, the CRA, uh, a number of uh, a number of uh, codes of practice in the UK, are all aimed at moving away from a more um, from a voluntary framework to a more regulatory framework for cybersecurity. And I think you know um, CISA has always been of the position that cybersecurity voluntary standards are great but it's it's become clear that they're not um they're not sufficient that uh 
the you know the speed of trying to get to market, uh, the the existing market pressures uh, still encourage. Um, companies to, uh, you know, to sort of forget about cybersecurity or or not build it in from the front end. I think the fact that we don't have cybersecurity, for example, in computer science curricula across the country also contributes to this trend. Uh, but because of all of that, I think the federal government has now decided, you know, like we need to step in here. You saw, obviously, you also see SEC taking uh, taking action. Uh, so it's it's going to be interesting to see whether those. Uh, what I'm curious to see is whether those actions are going to uh, result in less cybersecurity attacks in the near future. Yeah, we're going to come back to that question of efficacy because there is, uh, you know, that is a that is definitely a big question there. I mean, so Jeet, from your perspective, you know, I was saying that you know this, you know, really seems to mark a sea change in how we're approaching um, cybersecurity, particularly from a government standpoint. And would you agree with that? Yeah, apologies for for dropping off, um, and hopefully I'm not repeating myself. But yeah, kind of plus ones everything Tatiana said. It, it's it's the shift, and then all the all the attacks that happen, and then the federal government realizing that they couldn't just sit back. So then you had the executive order, and then you had the national cybersecurity strategy, and you had CISA's, uh, and then the implementation plan, and then CISA's guidance, and and their secure by design efforts. Um, so yeah, it's all kind of coming down. Um, and part of what I'm curious about, though, that we haven't seen yet uh, in the U.S. side is legislation. And if, if that's going to be possible or is the U.S. government going to have to kind of rely on the power of the purse and using executive orders to say, if you want to sell to the federal government, then this is what you're going to have to do. And is that just going to the assumption, I guess, is the trickle down, right? That if you're, you're not going to make two different types of software, you're going to make what you make for DOD is what you're going to make for the, the private sector as well. So. I'm um, a little curious about the legislation and I'm also curious to see if if this this approach will work uh, through executive orders and and regulations on selling to the USG. Now, we'll have to push back a little on the legislation piece because I think that we've seen some legislation already, like uh, like uh, the the work, the legislation around DOD uh, and uh and giving more funding to uh, the cyber mission force. Uh, we've seen some legislation bumping up budgets for CISA. Uh, we kind of more incentive based though, right? Yes, yeah. And so I think like you don't see the, right now the legislation was all focused around sort of reorganizing or re, you know, uh, funding appropriately the federal government or even state and, and local, right? There was a $2 trillion or $2 billion uh, fund for state and local cybersecurity, which was fantastic. Uh, we have not seen it as uh, incentives for, uh, for industry or, you know, regulation industry, which, you know, I think that's probably right. But um but uh, it, it is, we did have some. Yeah, point take. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, from, from my perspective, the, you know, one of the reasons that we didn't, when I was in the White House, for example, that we didn't pursue a, a cybersecurity strategy was, I, I was honestly worried that, like, putting out a formal strategy would have resulted in a document that said, cybersecurity is good, we need more of it. Um, and, you know, and that would have taken a year of like interagency labor to produce that, um, you know, which wouldn't have actually said anything. But this document, the one that most recently came out and along with the implementation plan actually has some really important concepts in it that I want us to, you know, uh, unpack and discuss. And I would say that, you know, it's clear that it's talking about saying, you know what, we're going to start putting some baseline cybersecurity requirements into place across a multiplicity of industries. Right. So that's one. So that gets it. That's out of your point about like we're going to move away from this purely and voluntary approach that we've used. The second one is this idea of secure by design. Right. That we're also going to start saying really software manufacturers, you bear some responsibility for how your stuff actually is produced and works out in the real world. And the third is this idea that we're going to actually that the ecosystem has pushed all of the security burden all the way out to the edge. And so that everybody is sort of responsible for their own cybersecurity, whether that whether that atomic unit is my mom, right? Or, you know, JP Morgan Chase, right? And it's sort of, that's not a particularly effective way to 
uh, do security. So we're going to actually look at reallocating that security burden um, and shifting some of it across the ecosystem. And they're all interlinked. All of those concepts are, are linked. You can't really completely separate them out. But I would say those are three very distinct facets of the, the strategy. And I want to sort of explore those concepts. And, you know, particularly the, you know, security burden idea, um, you know, and reallocating that, shifting it, realigning it, um, sort of what does that concept mean to you? And sort of um, what does it, what do you think of when you think of the strategy talking about that? And maybe we'll start with Tatiana I, first time. Oh, uh, okay. So no, Fiji, go ahead. So. Well, it's been ingrained by Chris Inglis and me that I, the first thing I think of is seat, our seatbelts, right? Because yeah, yeah. that was the analogy that we heard over and yeah. over again was that you buy a car, you don't have to buy a seatbelt with it too, right? And if if what you're producing is has potential liability, then you should also all, uh, create some you know additional security with with that potential liability. So and yeah, I, 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 the first thing I think of it are, are seatbelts. <laughs> and and that's it. clearly what the people writing the strategy had in mind was the motor vehicle experience, where until the 1960s, the responsibility for not dying in a car was solely the motorists. And then we started designing roads that were safer and constructing them with you know crash barriers. And we started offering driver's ed rather than you learning on your dad's lap. Law enforcement started doing you know speeding and drunk driving crackdowns. But what moved the needle more than anything else is what Sajid said. We started making manufacturers responsible for making cars that wouldn't tip over and had seat belts and crumple zones and the things we've come now we're all we're all the way into this discussion of self-driving cars. I think that is what moved the needle, Michael, beyond where we were that cybersecurity is good do it to something where we said, well, what worked in other broad, complicated facets of our life? And I, th I mean, over and over again, they kept pointing back to experience with, with motor vehicle safety, which gets into liability and standards and all the other things I think we'll probably talk about. Yeah. And I think it's also interesting too, because the counter argument that you often hear is that any, all of this will instantaneously kill off all innovation in the IT sector. Um, and last I checked, we have evolved our cars since the 1960s or our medical equipment or our financial service products, or you can keep going with the list. I don't find that argument. I, you can do things that will d dissuade innovation, but I don't think establishing some liability and some responsibility and some of these requirements of necessity kills in all innovation. So. Yeah, well, and so I will say that it's not even I, I don't hear, you know, too much of a complete pushback around secure by the design or default, because I, I think a lot of a lot of organizations agree that security is foundational to digital trust and safety. We certainly believe that at Google. It's at the core of, you know, all of our products. Um, and our mission has always been to build secure software. Uh, but I think uh, there's there are some debates within the the concepts around, you know, uh, are we talking about uh, building security in from the ground up? Are we talking about build, you know, uh, secure software development practices, mm -hmm. or are we talking about specific mechanisms? Like, are we talking principles, or are we talking mechanisms for uh, for those things? So, you know, one of the things that we've had a, a number of conversations with CISA about as they've been drafting their secure by design uh, papers, uh, or, or iterating on the paper that they, they put out, is the fact that, you know, while certain uh, certain mechanisms like uh, offering logging for free, all logging, or um, or doing memory moving to memory safe languages, are uh, what uh, you know what companies should sign up to. Uh, we if we if we focus on those mechanisms, we may find ourselves in five or ten years uh, stuck in old technology, right? Instead of moving sort of further down the line. Instead, I think what's most important is that we focus on building software securely and then also making sure to do that second part, which is getting it into the hands of the people who are actually using it. So like one of the biggest things that I think uh, is currently preventing the development and the, uh, the uh, sort of the, the the movement towards software security is that the federal government doesn't actually incentivize the buying of secure products, 
right? They're sort of stuck in this existing system in which we live. And the, you know, the military industrial complex mixed with the frustration of the, uh, you know, the procurement process ends up with a, a similar sort of result in the back end. And so even with, you know, uh, even with existing products that we know have significant vulnerabilities, those still get certified and bought uh, often even on, on sole source contracts when we know that there are better uh, better products out there that are investing more in cybersecurity. Uh, and so I think that's another area that that's the, those are the principles that we need to instill to make sure that we have a more secure ecosystem. Yeah, and I think this gets at actually, this is a sort of related to the question that Jim um, and you and I were starting to talk about. And so, Gene, I think this was while you were dropped off, which is there's also this question of efficacy, right? Mm -hmm. Of how do we actually know that any of this is actually going to help us? And I think it's an interesting question, too, about like, how do you set the, how do you, if you're going to regulate more, like, how do you do that in a way that is actually smart? And, you know, I think about like, Okay, I think it's pretty safe to say, for example, that you 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 want to say you you need to use multiple factors of authentication, right? To um, to do that process of of getting into a system and authenticating that you, who you are, who you say you are. But you certainly don't want to be specifying the mechanisms that you have to use for that, right? Because if we've been having this conversation three years ago, we probably all would have said, yeah, you know what. That text messaging, you know, using SMS as a second factor, you're you're good. Now I would tell you, well, that's better than that's better than nothing, but um, there's a lot of stuff that's actually much better than that. So you wouldn't want to get stuck, right, in that world of you know, you wouldn't want the regulation saying thou shalt use SMS. Um, right. Well, and in fact, yeah. like we uh, have at Google have already moved to pass keys, right, which moves right. past a password. Word. But certain right. regulations, certain uh, certain uh, certain certifications require by, by it, within the regulation something about passwords. And if you are uh, if you are a system that moves past that type of security, you're stuck in this doom loop doom loop where you can't actually you can't actually claim that you are certified and accredited based on an old existing standard, which is why it's so important that we're focusing on the principles uh, while getting rid of some of these really bad practices that we have identified as, uh, you know, we, you know, uh, an issue to security, like the, one of the latest breaches, right? Uh, um, being able to move between the com a commercial and an enterprise environment, right? Or, uh, you know, being, uh, having data that was able to be taken from a, a <clears throat> legacy test tenant environment, right? That's the kind of thing that we need to address. I, mean, I, I, I sorry, sorry. You know, I think the challenge it's uh, for the government is how do you create a, a regulation or a legislation, mostly a regulation, or, or you know, where you want there's got to be some bite, right? Where you do you actually change behavior, but you can't over kind of script it or regulate it so that you're, and then to Tatiana's point too, it, it, and your your point, it, it can be outdated pretty quickly, right? So how do you create a, a flexible thing that um, software producers will will abide by and allow for flexibility and innovation in, in the future? Go ahead, Jim. I mean, I, I think regulation works for establishing a floor, a, a minimally acceptable standard, and it works best for simple subjects. Like, here's what I'm going to tell you about multi-factor authentication, because you try to be very descriptive and cover all the cases in laying out regulation, as opposed to guidance, where you make it outcome-based and leave it to someone to do. And that's why, I, you know, I step back and say, what are the levers of change that government really has? We have the carrots and sticks. We can use regulation or legislation. We can create incentives where people would catch more, much more flies with, you know, honey than vinegar. Got the power of procurement. You already mentioned that one, Sanjeet. And I think we really saw that. I saw that personally with zero trust in and the executive order, because as late as 2020, I could have deep theological discussions with my former peers in government about whether zero trust was viable, even though we have done it at scale in the private sector. And boom, then you get EO12333 saying government's going to do it, going to do it quickly. You start getting frameworks, you start getting models, you get a government commitment to buy in. Now two thirds of enterprises are implementing it as well. 
power of procurement and that trickle down effect you talked about. A lot of companies want to buy government grade solutions. That's one of the strongest tools government has, models and approaches. When we made the NIST cybersecurity framework back in 2014, version 1.0, we thought we were making a roadmap and a scorecard just for government. If you had told me that people around the world were going to understand, identify, detect, protect, respond, recover, I would have said, in what world? In this world. And then transparency, things like cyber trust mark, where let's assume some consumers want to make informed decisions how that energy star model works. So the you know government's got a lot of tools that I think are more applicable in many cases than regulation or certainly than legislation. And, and one of the strongest ones might be you know using the NIST to establish those standards. You know I think most private sector companies are 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 good with the NIST standards and and want to want to follow them because they're best practices, right? And maybe that's the best the, the best way to handle it is establish best practices, maybe defined by the NIST, which everyone pretty much can agree on. And, and, and take that route versus uh, you must do X, Y, Z uh, or face the consequences. Also, NIST just has a really great reputation of working a, a, a very um, thorough process that is involved that involves all the different stakeholders, and that's why I think the resulting um, standards from from NIST are so well regarded uh, and accepted by industry. Um, SSDF. Uh, as well. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, there's, you know, that that's definitely uh, one, one direction to go. Uh, I also think there's something to the idea of taking a look at security performance for, uh, for procurement, right? Uh, if you, if you set something like liability or fines for, uh, you know, not meeting certain benchmarks, certain companies can afford to pay them, right? And and you're really just putting a tax on poor poor performance or poor security. But if you're actually taking a look at security performance during the procurement process, and you have to prove uh, or, or create barriers for people with worse security performance, right? Then you're actually uh, judging based on outcomes and procuring based on those, right? So I think that's something else to consider. Yeah, I think I wanna pull a little bit on this thread about software liability, because I think that's gonna become a, a key area of debate. And so you, you were asking about legislation and things like that. And I, I, I think this is an area where it would take legislation to really make a fundamental change to the market dynamics. But, you know, it's a very interesting thing to me that, you know, software is one of the few industries where, you know, you don't, a, a, you know, producers bear virtually no responsibility for how the product actually performs out in the world uh, compared to a lot of other places. Now, the complexity, right, is that you can never get away from the fact that you have stupid users, right, that do um, that do things, you know, just like, but just like, you know, we're going to go back to the car analogy, just like you can't, you know, you can't deal with the fact that some people just drive like idiots. I mean, we're all from Washington, right? So we know, we, we live this every day, right? You know, um, and you can't get away from that. And so I think it's, it, but it's finding that balance in there. And Jim, and I know you can even you add, add maintenance to the car, right? Like right. you have yeah. to maintain the cars as well. As right. The, yeah. I mean, if you, if you run it to the point where the oil in the engine block freezes up, that's not the manufacturer's fault. Yeah. You know? yeah I mean, there, there's a story. My dad did that one time. <laughs> I mean, I think everyone accepts at the end of the day, the driver is still ultimately responsible, even if they're driving a Tesla. But there are now accepted roles in the ecosystems and liability for not doing your part. And I think they're strongest on the manufacturer. I mean, and to your point, Michael, people go back to the manufacturer if their car squeaks when they buy it. And yet, you know, we accept you buy the software. It's your responsibility to make it all work and play well together on the platform. You're your own IT support. You know, in the name of innovation, we basically totally absolved producers of even performance, forget security, but even performance responsibility that, I mean, I look at it and go, software and guns are often this corner of liability-free performance that nothing else in, in the American product world has. Oh my God, software just got put in the same bucket as guns. <laughs> <laughs> I've just hit a new low for 2024. <laughs> early, make your mark early, Tark. Yeah. Make your mark early. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if we if we started to change some of that structure, though, like, you know, what, I mean, what would be, I mean, like, what would be the implications for the cybersecurity industry? I mean, you know, 
I mean, and it, it, cybersecurity products are software, right? I mean, this would, you know, have some implications for, for example, for semantics, indeed, about, you know, how you think about your products and things like that. Yeah. And also, do you, yeah, and, and do you change from uh, your security being a separate software or, or do you start adding that onto existing software or other companies' products and, and how would that work? And, and so that's kind of a question that, that does come up. Yeah, I mean, and Heather Atkins uh, on our side, uh, a, VP, a VP for security at Google, uh, put out a fairly uh, controversial statement and that she thinks that the entire cybersecurity industry is, you know, is, is shouldn't exist because it really is based on the fact that the software is developed poorly in many cases and we accept weakness uh, and, uh, and I think that, you know, we generally think, I mean, from our perspective, we think that we users shouldn't expect that you, we shouldn't expect consistent ransomware. There, for example, has never been ransomware and never been one instance of ransomware on a Chrome device. So like, you know, it's, it's not a guarantee. I think we need to change that mindset a little bit, um, because we're just so used to hacks happening on every single platform, but it's not true. Uh, I think that like there are, there are more, uh, dedicated security teams or, or more well-resourced security teams, companies that uh, put more, uh, emphasis, uh, on security than others. And, uh, you know, I think that like, we need to reward the good actors and, and, uh, and take a look at what we can do with the bad actors to get their, uh, at least as you said, Jim, the baseline security standards up, uh, where we do some of our, you know, some of the basics like separating, you know, environments, uh, revoking access to legacy, uh, to legacy, uh, accounts and, uh, and doing, doing encryption, you know, all of the things that we know to be best practice. So I think you're getting we're getting back to that point of transparency where I think government can promote that. Is there any way to help, you know, the equivalent of a market rating? I don't want to say, you know, magic quadrant, but and because again, consumers don't even know what that is, but some way of saying here are organizations that take this seriously, that live this, that are paying the literal cost to do it the secure way. Um, and they get something that that denotes that status in a fashion that end users will recognize. Yeah, and I think there's there's also, I think, you know, we could continue to make some some divisions in our policy. And I think it's right to focus on, you know, it, it it's always difficult to sort of draw precise lines around, you know, for example, critical infrastructure. But I I do think that sort of saying, you know, there are some functions in our in the digital ecosystem that you know what, if you're the owner and operator of that, you bear some additional responsibility for investing in security. I mean, that's the, you know, with your great power comes great responsibility, right? You know, it's sort of the, you know, that comes with the uh, the position. I think the other thing that strikes me that um, I think we also need to look at, though, is, you know, we tend to talk about critical infrastructure by the verticals, you know, financial services or healthcare and I think my experience has been that, in fact, actually, the the there's a a divide that is actually much more what I think of as horizontal. That the big players in each industry, right, the very large companies, the large energy companies, the large healthcare conglomerates, the large financial services companies, are actually much more similar in what they can do in their cybersecurity than they are with the smalls in their own industry. And the same thing is true that like the small water utility with the small regional bank with the you know local hospital system or whatever they actually share a lot more similarities to each other um and in some ways i wonder if we need to be thinking about some of our policies and more of that horizontal structure than the ver you know than the industry verticals because you know we don't really need to help like aetna or jp morgan with their cybersecurity. they they you know we can expect them to do that but you know some of the smaller players we actually probably need to give more assistance to well that's why i was so happy that the um for the two billion dollar state and local cybersecurity grants yeah. and uh you know i think it's 
it's imperative that we are focusing on in that area. Um, it's, it, you know, it's not right that there's only, you know, there's cyber haves and have nots. I, I think we, we should, uh, the federal government uh, at a minimum should be, you know, helping and, and providing guidance. And there's also a role to play, a role to play for some of the larger players. We certainly uh, try and do uh, our part to help critical infrastructure uh, and other smaller organizations uh, increase their cybersecurity. Uh, but I also think there's, um, but again, I think you can't, you can't, uh, walk away from the the part about the larger players having some sort of ro- some accountability for the the uh, products that they put out. But I, I you know we've talked about procurement and and I do a lot of work with state and local government and I think the the weak part not only do we have your rural electric co-ops and you know and, and small health providers you have local government who don't even have full time IT support much less a cybersecurity person and they're out there buying digital infrastructure or they're buying infrastructure with their IIJA money. The person who's writing this contract may know what a good highway proposal looks like, but they don't know how to what how to even think about security for the sensors that are going into that it's a mission impossible to expect them to do that so we either have to have a library where they can go look at exemplars or the rising tide where we have said all of these products now have an acceptable level of security should mean they don't have to think about it because otherwise we're engineering weaknesses into stuff we're going to live with for a long time michael to your point i think you know your distinction between the JP Morgan and being similar to Aetna versus JP Morgan being similar to a smaller bank. It's, it's, it's resources, right. And, and who's got the resources, either the money or the personnel to, to handle the, the cybersecurity threats. But on the flip, it's like, if you buy software, you're buying software and it shouldn't matter the size of your company because you're buying the same software. Right. And so that's, I think, to the point of the, the secure by design, right? Like you're, you're a consumer, you're buying the product. And it shouldn't impact me any differently based off of the size of my company or, or government, uh, but more how I use it. Um, so, and that's, I think, why why there's such a push for this. I mean, I, I looked we, at it. We, yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry. Well, we hear a lot from our customers that they are extremely concerned yeah. that like, you know, just everyone in the ecosystem, they're concerned if they're buying software that um, they're going to, uh, they're one configuration error away from a hack. And that's a really rough like place to live, right? To be so concerned with one, you know, one admin decision away from, uh, you know, from getting your all your data stolen or uh, being locked out of your systems. So I, I think I we are very much focused on that secure by default. Uh, and secure by design work, uh, which they are about to release a number of papers on the way Google does secure by design uh, and the way we think about memory safety. Uh, we actually just also did a bug hunters blog about how our bug hunters use uh, the concept of secure by design and the, and the type of uh, metrics they see. Uh, because it's it's important that we continue to focus on rising rising that tide. We it's it's not enough. Um, it's not enough to just, uh, you know, give more resources. It You have to get the, the general software up to where uh, the people who really invest in it uh, do it. You know, it, if you are, uh, if you are, if you have best practices, share best practices and, and uh, hopefully uh, more people will take them up. That's where I give this, this approach, this strategy, great credit for saying, okay, every, all of the other 15 sectors and all of the end users rely on commercial off-the-shelf products of the IT sector. So hold, we are the equivalent of the automaker. So hold us responsible for doing it right and figure out how you want to do that. But if you make, if you pick on us, put us in the spotlight and get us to do it in a fashion that works, everyone benefits collectively without them having to be informed about configuration decisions or procurement decisions. Like any other product they buy, they have a reasonable expectation that it will just work. Right. And the idea, I think, of that security by default, right, is that, you know, it you actually have to work at being insecure, right? That And that's, and that's fine. You know, the researchers can take it and they can turn off all the stuff and they can play around with it and the you know, and do some of the things, but then your normal user is not, like you said, Tatiana, sort of one one uh, slider button away from, you know, disaster. 
Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's an important concept as well. Yeah, like loosening guides, not hardening guides. Right. And, and, right. and making it and making it noisy and making, you know, you can turn it off, but it's going to remind you periodically and it's going to affirmatively remind you of the risks you are running and accepting by doing it, not just, you know, a set and forget by mistake. Some, you know, I, I, there was a lot of good guidance in that, uh, that document, the white paper that CISA and, you know, other agencies and 15 other countries signed on to. I mean, if we literally could say, the IT industry, software and hardware are doing, starting with that, then I think that would make a that would make an appreciable difference. But I think so from the industry standard, particularly from some of the larger players, I will say that it is difficult to sign up to all of those types of, um, all of those metrics, all of those measures that they're proposing, the particular mechanisms with which they're requiring or that they're suggesting you implement secure by design. Because if you look at a company like Google, you're looking across like 10 different product areas, 10 different, completely different products, right? Everything from Android to Chrome to cloud, right? Maps, it's, they have different, uh, they're different products with different stakeholders. Uh, and so the, you know, signing up uh, to, you know, requirements like that, that are so con sort of um, constricting and uh, specific becomes challenging. And while we are 100% behind the secure by design concept, it's the specific mechanisms like requiring memory safe languages or requiring logging for free without really having conversations with industry that is uh, that that knows a lot about logging and how it really works and the costs and benefits of uh, of keeping all logs, for example, uh, the that leads you to a, a leads you to a place where you know we're not all industry is aligned um, with that with that position. So same with memory safe programming. It sounds easy when 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 Cisco says, "Oh, eighty percent of 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 exploitable errors go away if you simply do this." Well, it means in some cases throwing away entire code bases. Billions of lines of code that a company has. And oh, by the way, people don't often point out that memory safe programming languages usually run slower than their non memory. Do you want your, you know, your, your time sensitive trends? You know, there's a whole bunch of things they don't think about. So you look for compensating controls. So yeah, it's a, it's a little more nuanced than the black and white. Do the following things and we're all good. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, think the they'd be better focused, right, on on defining the problem that they want to eradicate versus trying to define the solution that needs to be implemented. If, if they can point to what you're trying to solve and and have some flexibility in solving it, I think it, it'll help get to that solution better than trying to figure out ways to solve it and putting that in regulations. Yeah, so, and it, the government, I think, needs also to be more honest about the price that has to be paid, yeah. right? It's not, um, and it has to be paid by someone, right? It, or or a group of people, but either way, it's, is it, are you, are you losing speed? Are you, do you have to do more sandboxing? Are you, uh, in, you know, are you doing cost? Are some people just, dis, some organizations deciding just not to do it uh, because it's very difficult to move all of their code base from C++ to Rust. So I think the, I think that discussion also uh, needs to happen and across a wide variety of players, particularly the people who will have to implement uh, these, uh, you know, these suggestions or principles. And so, uh, you know, I think that's that that piece about who's going to pay or how, what is the price? I think that we haven't really discussed that. You know, and I, that's a, I mean, that's an important point, Tatiana, that, you know, there is a price here. There, there, the market functions the way the market does, partially because of policy, but also, you know, there are market dynamics that exist. Like, why is it that, you know, there are essentially only two, you know, operating systems for mobile devices, right? Market market dynamics drive that, right. um, you know, why are there essentially only three operating systems, right? I mean, market dynamics drive that. Um, there is a reason that monocultures develop, right? And all, so, you know, all of these things, when you're talking about shifting some of that, you are definitely, you know, you're, there are costs involved. Now, of course, we're paying a cost in terms of security and other things. And so this is really about sort of how you redistribute those costs and 
but you're absolutely right that if you sort of go into this, well, it's just free, then yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna get anywhere. Um, yeah, I think that was pretty evident too, and and you know the self attestation form, which I think is an example of things that you should be doing right based off of the standards. And you know we've talked to our IT compliance, and it's taking a while, but it was like you know these are things that we, we as a company should be doing if we're not already doing it. But to Tatiana's point, you can't say on the form that this only should take your company you know fifteen hours or thirty hours or whatever it said on the form. Where, where we've been spending hundreds of hours to try to make sure that we we meet these requirements. And so there has to be some honesty, not just in the cost, like actual money, but the the resources and the man hours uh, that it takes to, to accomplish these goals. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that I, the, that I continually say nowadays that talk about, you know, people ask me what lessons that I've learned about like threat intelligence sharing from having run CTA. And what I, one of the things I always lead with is it's hard, right? Like it's not easy. Everybody acts like it ought to be easy and it's not, it's not easy. And I think that um, you have to go into with eyes wide open about what we're actually, you know, what we're actually asking to do, even if it's the right thing, right? Um, you still have to acknowledge that like it comes with a cost and it's some of that cost is time, right? Um, and that, it's not something that you can just, we didn't get here, um, you know, overnight. And so we're not going to move away from the, where we are in the market, you know, overnight. Um, we're coming up on the end of our time. Um, and so what I was really thinking was as sort of the final question here. What are some issues that haven't gotten as much media play, um, but, um, but could have some serious implications for the cybersecurity industry? What are there changes, policy changes, either here or around the world? What are you seeing that's coming that hasn't gotten as much media play, but could have some profound, um, profound impacts on the industry? And whoever wants to sort of take that. Okay, so we've talked about this approach, Michael, as let's use market forces to drive this. All right, we had 15 other countries sign up too. What do you do if a major foreign IT producer, say China, doesn't opt into this approach and continues to lure price conscious consumers, the end users we're talking about, what are we going to do? How is that going to play out as a policy issue? Are we looking at banning entire country? And I mean, this is one where I haven't really seen anybody talk about, yeah, we want to use the forces of the market, right? And that's assuming all producers are on a level playing field playing the game. I think the um, the data EO uh, is going to have some profound um, some profound impacts on the uh, on some of these uh, on some of our uh, companies and policies. Uh, the way that they define sensitive data, what now gets included in that? Um, you know, how do we share information across borders? Um, what that'll mean for cybersecurity. Um, I think that there's there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. And, I, you know, th as the EO comes out and uh, the, um, the implementation uh, gets started, I think there's a lot of nuance that needs to be addressed within the EO. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, more for some of the providers, but I'm, I'm curious to see, and Michael, you and I have talked about this briefly too, is, is where the know your customer requirements are, are going to go. And is that, to my earlier point, is that trying to solve a problem or is it, you know, I, would it have been better to identify the problem and let industry kind of come up with how to best resolve that issue of, for example, um, reselling of, of platforms that go to uh, foreign governments that you can't, or foreign countries that you can't track if you, if for law enforcement purposes. And, and, but it keeps coming back, right? It's, it was not in just one EO, but, but more than one requirement. And so uh, I'm interested to see how that'll play out and, and what the pushback will be, because that goes away from kind of the best practices and, and um, standards that we've been talking about earlier. Yeah. And I think that's a good example. The, the know your customer requirements, like <clears throat> the, you know, different arguments get mixed up in there. And I think one of the one of the challenges has been that some of the providers have used um, ha have led with the oh that'll cost a lot of money argument and the problem is that uh, with all due respect to our 
person from Google here, nobody really cares if Google or Amazon or Microsoft is forced to spend a few billion. Like just that's just not gonna like that's just not gonna like cause anybody any heartache, right? The real uh, but the irony though, though to me is that are those KYC requirements gonna push out the smaller providers and, yes, and maybe no, help and, the and bigger providers, right? And that that see, this is where the that's what I mean is the debate's been over there. And really yeah. the question is like what, what does that mean for the smaller providers? Does it actually work in the cybersecurity context, right? Will it actually have the effect that you want of uh, preventing the malicious use of U.S. infrastructure? Because that's, at the end of the day, that's what you're really trying to do, or at least that's what I think you should be trying to do with that. And so yeah. I think that's where the debate now needs to be is like, okay, what's, if your goal is to reduce the malicious use of U.S. cloud infrastructure for doing bad things, then what's the most effective mechanism to actually to actually do that? Because it's not like any of the cloud providers, big, small, or indifferent, uh, or big, small, or in between, want that to be going on. Right. So how do we, you know, how do we actually empower them to to do that? And what are the right mechanisms to actually make that happen? And I think the you know, I, and I think that's where the debate really needs to drive now is on that, you know to get at those mechanisms so that we get it right, you know, so that if we are going to spend some significant bucks on it, that we at least get the result that we want um, at the end of the day. Yeah, so absolutely. I think, you know, we've had a really great, um, a really great discussion here. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. We could probably keep going for, you know, an extended period of time because uh, there's a lot to talk about in this area, but I really appreciate all of you taking the time to, uh, chat with me today. I think this has been a great, uh, great discussion, and I'm sure we'll, you know, we'll get to continue it in different, uh, different policy forms. So, Jim, Tatiana, Sanjeet, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me today, and I'll look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank, thank you. For the you. Thank you. Thank you.